I'm going to do one story a week or, or two stories a week, no matter what. Whatever I set out to do on that Bible study, we'll get finished with. So next week we'll be clean. We'll see. Um, so the sto- where we're, we're going tonight is, um, let me put your stuff aside and my stuff here. Uh, we live in, in uh, biblically illiterate times, and, and I think I said that the other day in the sermon. Uh, this bothers me not only on a personal level, but on, on a spiritual level, uh, particularly because here's the problem. If we don't know the Bible and all its stories, as well as the overarching primary story of, of the Bible... And how all the other stories, the other little stories in the Bible fit together with this big one. Um, It will not only affect where we will spend eternity, but it will also have a tremendous impact on how our (coughs) lives uh, are lived and how we experience life in this world. Um, If you don't know the stories of the Bible, how, for instance, will will you be able to tell your children or your grandchildren, your nieces uh, or your nephews, or how will you be able to know yourself about who you are, um, where you came from, where you're headed, and what's expected of you in in the meantime? Um, We know nothing of those things apart from the Bible. The Bible is where those answers are come from. We don't know about morality, about truth, about virtue, about goodness, about faith or hope or love without the Bible. The Bible is basically the operator's manual that God has given us for how to live uh, in the time we have here and how to make it uh, to life with God forever. Um, For 150 years, I guess, uh, schools around the world have been telling children that Charles Darwin uh, and his theory of evolution is not a theory, but they've been presenting it as fact, even though it's still officially a theory. Um, our government now is talking about openly uh, about things that it once uh, denied, UFOs, now they call them UAPs, Unidentified Aerial Phenomenon. Um, I don't know why they changed it. It sounds cooler to say it the other way. Uh, um, but there's a lot of discussion in the world of science, uh, all the way to the world of philosophy now, on whether or not there's life outside this planet, what it all means, and, and if so, um, perhaps that everything we once believed about the or- origin of human civilization, even to Darwin, is wrong now because of what they're seeing up in the sky. The Bible counters all that. By telling us what is right, what is true, what is good, what is beneficial, what is absolutely without error. Uh, so we're going we're to take all this in. I think we have, um, my original goal was to do some stories this fall, but that ain't going to happen. We're going to do stories this fall, and we're going to transfer this over into the next spring semester. So we have 12 weeks before... Of, of Bible study before we break for Christmas. And we have 12 weeks in um, the winter uh, before we break for Easter. So that's 24 weeks. Now, there are some stories that we'll be able to do two in one session, some not. Um, what I would like to know, however, um, is what story... So everybody, before you leave tonight, maybe I'll put a piece of paper out there and you write down at least one story that you want to know more about so that I can, because I've got a game plan. I just want to see what works for for you all. So we'll do that. There's a lot more Bible uh, stories than just 24, um, uh, but um, I want to make sure that I honor what's important, but also what's important to you because... Um, I want us, my goal is for you all to know more about the Bible and its stories than you do right now. Now, again, there are more stories than 24, but I, um, 
intend to be here at this church as the pastor until, you know, I retire, God willing. So um, I'll be able to teach all the stories, but right now we're going to start with just these. Uh, but um, beyond the stories, I want you to know how they all fit in theologically, why they're important to us. Um, the stories, um, you see, are not meant to just convey a story, but to really teach us something beyond the story, something important, something significant, something on a, on a spiritual level. Uh, just as a for instance, did you know that the whole point uh, of, of, do you know what the point of the book of Jonah is about? You know that the fish in the story is actually incidental to the point of, of Jonah and his story. Um, what about, you know, um, Joshua fit the battle of Jericho? I was listening to Elvis saying that the other day, and the walls came tumbling down. But, you know, the walls are incidental to the story. Um, so I want us to know what's deeper and what's there. And even here in Genesis 1 in the creation account, most people today don't think of it much anymore if they think about it at all. And when they do, they think of it as a children's story. But, friends, it ain't a children's story. Um, one last thing I want to tell you that we need to know these stories because every story in the Bible points in one direction, and that's towards Jesus. Everything points towards Jesus. He is the center, the focus. And the entire point of the overarching story of the Bible. And everything we do points to Jesus. In a very real sense, the Bible is one story. Uh, it starts with God creating the heavens and the earth. Uh, and in the middle, it talks about Jesus coming to redeem what has fallen. And then it ends with the creation of the new heaven and the new earth and living face to face with this same Jesus. So it's one story. I think we know bits and pieces of it. We know little parts of it. We know some of it better than we know the other of it. But I hope that uh, in this we're going to know at least the parts that we study um, better than we knew them before. So that's my goal. And that's where we are. So... One of the things that I wanted to do uh, to start with is to, um, because we're talking about God and the, and the greatness of God and all that, I wanted to share with you this page. There's about 20 I put on there. They're called the attributes of God. These are sort of character traits of God or um, characteristics of God. We're not going to go into them. In any kind of depth, um, I put stuff down and some scripture references for you so you can look at them yourself. But it is important to know that when we talk about God, we're talking uh, about um, someone who is, well, let's just look and let's see. So God is holy. To be holy means completely different from everything else. Separate from everything else. He is perfection. He is righteousness. He is endlessly and always moral and virtuous and good and pure. God is glorious. God is the only God. Despite what anybody else says, there is only one God. Uh, God is infinite. He is not bound by time or space. He is not limited. He is incomprehensible. Uh, that doesn't mean he's not knowable. It just simply means that we can't comprehend the glory and the power and the bigness and the majesty of God. Uh, he is self-existent. This answers the question that every first grader asks, who made God? God always existed. His being is grounded in himself. He is self-sufficient. Um, he doesn't need anything else. Um, he is eternal. He has always existed. He is immutable. Um, he never changes. Uh, so what God, and this ties into his truthfulness, what God says, God does. He is not going to alter that in any way. God is omnipresent. He is not limited by, um, 
by space. Um, he is present everywhere. Um, he is omniscient. He knows everything. Past, present, future, and even what's possible. Um, he is omnipotent. That means he's all-powerful. He is all-wise. He is good. He is faithful. He is just. And he is merciful, gracious. He is love. And he is sovereign. Which means he is the supreme ruler. He has the right and the power and the authority to rule. And so... Um, that, those are the attributes of God and I think it's, uh, it's necessary sort of to, to know that as you go into it so that you can reflect back on well, you know who gives him permission or where did he get the right or any of that kind of stuff. Now the next thing on there I wanted you to practice your Hebrew for homework. Um, um, and so um, what I, now what I really wanted you to do is to see, where did I put it? Oh, there it is. Uh, I wanted you to see what it looked like so that you could, uh, so that you could sort of uh, get an idea. Hebrew, by the way, is written and read right to left. <coughs> so you start on the other side of the page, that why, that's why it looks funny. But uh, what I did do for you is put it in a two-column format below that. That, that whole Hebrew piece is, is um, the, the first chapter. Um, so, but then I split it up underneath that for you. Um, and I've got Genesis in, um, in English. I can't remember what the language is. And then the same thing over there. Um, better sheep is the, the English, uh, is the Hebrew word there. Um, just to give you an idea of what this uh, sounds like, I'll, I'll read you a little bit of it. Uh, first. <coughs> better sheep, bara Elohim et hasamayim, ve et haaretz, ve haaretz, haita to va vohu. Uh, and uh, that's it. I just said, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And, uh, the earth was formless and void, and darkness was over the face of the, earth, of the deep, and the Spirit of God was moving over the surface of the waters. And then, then God said, "Is Vayomer Elohim Yehi or Vahi or Vayar Elohim et Hayor Ki Ho Vayar Day Elohim Ben Hayor Uben Hachosek." And that's verse three and four. Uh, incidentally, if you're watching the news. Uh, from Israel or anything or try to pick up the Jerusalem Times. I can't really look at it. Modern Hebrew and Biblical Hebrew are as different as uh, Middle English or Old Chaucer's Old English and Modern English. It's, uh, it's almost, I mean, you, you might can pick out something, but you really can't pick out much. So, I'm of no use to anybody if we ever went to Israel. Uh, I can't read a thing there, except the Bible. So, uh, Genesis 1 is one of the two or three most important chapters of the whole Bible. And the reason for that is because it lays the foundation of everything that follows. Everything that comes after Genesis chapter 1. Um, as you read through the Old and the New Testament, you can see um, everybody from the prophets to the apostles uh, and the gospel writers, the evangelists, um, over and over again, going back to um, uh, the creation account, even Jesus, and pulling out you know, the truth that is applicable uh, 
uh, from that, uh, from, from the creation account. Uh, Genesis 1 lays the foundation for most of Scripture. And this is what I think is, is fascinating because we tend not to think of Genesis 1 as much more than just the, you know, the uh, prologue of the Bible. and sort of, you know, the kid's story where we can say he's got the whole world in his hands and sing that little song and go on. Um, but it is the foundation. Everything is built on Genesis chapter 1. Um, and it's filled with some of the most theolo important theological points uh, and, and some of the most important doctrines of, of the faith. Um, beyond that, it's also controversial. Uh, a lot of modern Christians uh, attempting to be accepted by the world will attempt, uh, well, they'll deny the truth of Scripture in order to do that. Um, now, they'll, they'll argue a way that, you know, when Scripture speaks to matters of faith, it's true, but when it speaks to other things, all bets are off. That's not correct. When the Scripture speaks on whatever matter it speaks on, you can count that on the fact that it is true. Now, it is true that the Bible is not a science book. It was not intended to be a science book. But when it speaks on matters of science, it does not err. Does that make sense for you? To you, I mean? Um, so... There was, a, there was a guy who, uh, a pretty, pretty famous uh, and scholarly guy, he was a, a, a scholar and theologian, and he wrote a commentary on the book of Genesis. And he wrote in there, though, almost all scientists agree that the world could not have been created in six days. So obviously... That is not what Genesis is telling us. It's not the message of the book. But now you see what he's doing. Apart from trying to gain the approval of the world, and it's interesting, a lot of times when Christians do this kind of thing, they're trying to gain approval of people who don't intend to be Christians. And they also don't care, you know, what you think to start with. But anyway, but he's also, he's also telling God that because of what some scientist thinks, that God can't do something in the time period that God says he can do it in. That's a pretty steep cliff to, to stand on, in my opinion. Now, but, it, it, you know, regardless of, of, of that, um, first and foremost, Genesis chapter 1 teaches us that there is nothing that God can cannot do. Period. Go back to the attributes. He is all powerful. He is infinite. He is all that. There's nothing he can't do. Um, do we understand every word in Genesis correctly? Um, like, for instance, and I'll get to that this later, but like, for instance, the the word y'all are gonna see some fascinating stuff right now. Y'all are gonna see Hold that one. Thank you. <laughs> no, thank you. I want it back. Yeah, that'd be good. Um, y'all gonna see left-handed writing. Um, the um well this is a bad pen. Bill pulled the ink out of it. Um, <laughs> The, the, the word Yom, uh, as, as in Yom Kippur, uh, the word Yom, and we're going to get to this in a minute, but it, but it means day. Um, did, did Moses mean a 24-hour day? Did he mean something else? Um, we'll, we, we can talk about that. Um, the, the, the issue with, with, with whether or not we understand something properly. The problem then lies with us and not with God. See, I, I'm of the opinion and many, many, many Orthodox Christian pastors are of the same opinion. 
If we come to something in the Bible that um, that we think may be wrong or we disagree with, it's not because God made a mistake or because it's wrong. It's because of us. It's because we don't have proper understanding or we don't have enough faith or that sort of thing. So that's that's where we are. But let me let me tell you. On the flip side, rather than a theologian taking um, the side of science. Here's a scientist who set out uh, to prove one thing, and he ended up proving that Genesis 1 is correct. Um, a guy named Herbert Spencer, he died in 1903, but he's a very famous guy. He was a popular scientist uh, around the world. He was given all kinds of prizes and everything. His greatest achievement was when he announced to the scientific world that he discovered that everything in the universe exists um, in, and it falls into five categories. Uh, one of five categories. He said it's time and force and action and space and matter. He was lauded for this. He spent his whole career to tell everybody that everything in the universe falls into, uh, into one of five categories. Time, force, Action, space, and matter. That's what he said. And in that order, guess what? God already told us that in the first verse of Genesis 1. In the beginning, that's time. God, that's force. Created, that's action. The heavens, that's space. And the earth, that's matter. Right there in verse 1. And poor old Herbert spent his entire life trying to figure it out. And he was done it in, you know, when he was five years old, he just read Genesis 1. He proved science, proved in 1903 when the Bible was right. Uh, but again, full disclosure, uh, the primary point of purpose of Genesis 1 is to teach us theologically about who God is and to teach us about what creation is. Um, so let's go. Let's look at Genesis 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now, if you will go back, i got to find it. Where's the, the, the uh, outline page? What do I do with it? Yeah, I don't have one. What do I do with it? I got it up here. No, I got, I got it. I don't, don't worry about it. I, I've got it. I know it, do you? Uh, it's here somewhere. See, I'm going to waste all y'all's time doing, looking for my um, So there was, um, there were some words on there that I, um, there were some words on there. Oh, I, I hear here it is right here. Um, Hebrew lesson for you. Um, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. So, um, uh, I want to uh, I want to show you a, a couple a couple of things. Um, Bara is to create. Uh, and it means to create from nothing. It doesn't mean to make in the sense of make a cake. Now, there are times in the Bible where a different word is used and it says God is our maker. And that's true. <laughs> And in the case of humanity, God is our maker because he's making us out of something that already existed, that he already created. Um, and, um, let's see if I can pull it out. Here we go. Loosen it up. On it. So, if I can write it, I can get the right piece, please. Oh, 
marker is is um, diagonal, and it's not helping me write left handed. Uh, so you got a Latin here, just pray diagonal. The Latin uh, phrase is creatio, creatio ex nihilo. And, and you probably heard, and you created out of nothing ex nihilo. You probably heard at least that part of it before. But bara means, in Hebrew, that four little word means to create from nothing. So this is a this is a, a, a completely interesting, this is literally pulling the rabbit out of the hat. This is making something from nothing. So this implies something, uh, or this, it tells something about God that, um, that is unique in, in and of itself. That nobody else can create out of nothing. So right there in the first word, remember in Hebrew it's Berashi. So, um, so Bera, uh, it, it, it sets the stage out of nothing. Literally it says out of nothing uh, God created. So Berashit. Um, so um, the that part of it goes together. And then um, Elohim is an interesting word because it is the majestic plural form of God. Um, anytime you see um, an I am ending in, um, in Hebrew, now you don't need to know this at all. <coughs> But the I am ending in Hebrew makes it plural. It's um, uh, like Goi uh, is uh, Gentiles. Uh, uh, but so Elohim is plural. And then you go where it says, you know, a little further down later, let us make man in our image. You get that, that idea of plurality. Now, I'll, I'll come back to that in, in just in just a moment, but um, I want you to hold that thought in your head for now. Uh, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the water. Um, now... If you go down to H in your little Hebrew lesson, Ruach, it, it, you say some Hebrew words like you're about to spit. Ruach. Ruach. The, uh, the, the Greek word is pneuma. Um, and it, it means the same thing. Um, See if this one will work. This one might be better. Uh, yeah, that's a little better. Got a little backwards on myself, but pneuma. That's where you get the word pneumonia. It means to breathe. Uh, it also means the breath or spirit of God. So you have Elohim. Now here you have the Holy Spirit. So you have God the Father, God the Holy Spirit. John 1.1 1, 1 says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and nothing that was created was created without Him. The book of Hebrews, it also says something very similar. So the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are a part of creation. It's not just as in children's Bibles and in children's Sunday school lessons you have this picture of the old bearded man sitting on a cloud with his finger down or Michelangelo's um, uh, uh, Sistine Chapel. It's not just the Father creating. You have the, uh, the whole of the Trinity created. The Trinity does not act apart from itself. So, so we, have, we have that going on. The central truth of Genesis chapter 1 is that God is the sole creator. 
that there is no uh, other creator. God and God alone has the power and the wisdom to create, and God and God alone is sovereign over everything he made. So, in other words, nobody, nothing can create apart from God, and God has total control over everything that, that he uh, creates. In other words, nothing is outside of the authority or the control of God, not even the devil. Everything acts in submission and subservience to God. Now, here, by the way, I, keep, I was about to say Moses, but I meant to tell you, Moses wrote the book of Genesis. Moses wrote the first five books of the Bible. And that's why the Jews to this day refer to them as the books of Moses, the Torah, um, and uh, uh, also called the Pentateuch. Pentateuch is the Greek word. It means five. So it's the first five books of the Bible. The Torah, uh, the, that word means law. Uh, because the law of Moses, the law of God, is found in those first five books. But Moses is the author. Now, what Moses um, uh, is most concerned about here um, is um, not something that you would you would think. Moses is not concerned about proving the existence of God. He just comes right out of the chute with the declaration that God, he didn't give proof for God's existence. He said, here it is. This is it. God made it. God is there. Um, um, and, and so uh, he just, he goes, um, he, he moves on. What's important to Moses is in verse, starts in verse 2. He wants to get into the details of the story. Um, so, having stated that God did it, he wants to get into the details. And look at the world and, and uh, look at creation in, in verse 2. Um, it's formless. It's void of structure. God is hovering over everything, and he's getting ready to act. And then we enter into the six days of creation. Uh, there, there are specifics that we'll get into on those, but there's a theme that runs through um, that ties them all together. A slightly different theme, uh, secondary theme, runs through the, the days four, five, and six, but the first three days of creation um, show that God is a God of process and a God of order. God is not a God of disorder. Um, God is, is taking uh, uh, something that he made, yet that right now is not um, inhabitable. It's uninhabitable, and he's making it inhabitable uh, for us. Uh, the first three days of creation are um, all about God moving into this chaos and this formless and void um, Existence and then making it structured and, and making it ordered and make it a place not only for us but also th that he can later inhabit. Think about um, when the Bible tells us about um, God walking in the Garden of Eden in the cool of the day. That's in um, that's later in, in uh, chapter two of of uh, Genesis, chapter three of Genesis. And then, of course, Jesus, God in the flesh, was born and lived here. So God is making a place not only for us, but he's making a place um, for himself. And so that's, you know, I think that's a really an important part of, of, the, of the creation account that we overlook. Verse 3, God says, let there be light. And there was light. God saw the light was good. And now back to your Hebrew uh, word of the day. There's a word down there, tov, uh, or tov, uh, T-O-V. See it down there? Uh, you might know it from the, uh, uh, the uh, Jewish uh, cheers, uh, muzzle tov, right? And tov means good. 
but it means more than just good. Like you don't, you know, uh, this is um, this is watered down at this point of the day, Dr. Pepper, and it ain't good when it's watered down. If it weren't watered down, it would be good, but not good in the sense that tall means. Tall means good in the sense that it is absent of bad. This is important. Um, God said it is good. There is no bad in it. Hold on to that thought. Um, God separated the light from the darkness, and God called the light day, and the darkness he called night, and there was evening, and there was morning the first day. In day one, God creates light. What does light do? It separates. It brings order. It separates day from night and light from darkness. It's, in, it's just amazing how orderly things are. This is day one of creation. Ultimate power over the universe, over the cosmos. Cosmos is bigger than the universe. Cosmos is the word that means everything that's created. Uh, the, 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 the most fascinating thing is that God speaks and it happens. Um, creation happens. He speaks and he brings order to chaos. He, he speaks and he brings things to pass. Um, Again, this is a really familiar story to us, but when we get so up close to a story, so familiar with it, we, we tend to disregard it, take it for granted, and not look for um, look for deeper meaning in it. But here's the thing. God can do anything. And this is the important thing to remember. The God that, that, we, that we serve, the God that we gather to worship, the God we read about, the God we sing about, the God we pray to can speak and bring everything into existence or can take everything out of existence. This God is a big God. And this is the question that I think we probably preachers ought to preach on more because I think if we did, there'd be a lot less anxiety, maybe a lot less um, uh, people just being hopeless and that sort of thing. We need to preach on how big God is, or turn it around, I can ask you the question, how big is God to you? This is, this is the, 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 the point. How, that Genesis is teaching us, Genesis 1, is that God is big. God is so big that he creates light without the sun. Now, did you notice that? He didn't create the sun yet. Sun, moon, and stars aren't, aren't there yet. They don't come up till day four. But there's light. God doesn't need the sun to create light. We need the sun to see and to be warm and to have food and everything else. God doesn't need the sun. He doesn't need the stars for light. Um, a lot of pagan uh, creation myths. Uh, you know, I always find it funny um, that, I mean, I want to go back to something about science, by the way, and tell you something that I meant to put in here. Um, you know, when I was when I was in school, and I guess some of y'all, um, maybe not Matt. He's a young he's a young boy. <laughs> but um, but when I yeah, still Matt, because they, they just they just found something. They just discovered something different the other day. So for the longest time, I guess ever since the fifties probably, and Louis Leakey and and all those people. They've been saying that um, humanity originated in somewhere in sub-Saharan Africa. So you're talking about central to South Africa. Well, that's contradictory to Scripture because, you know, if you 
talk about, if you look at the scripture, you see um, some of the geographical points that Moses lists in there, like the Tigris and the Euphrates River and things like that, then you got, you got trouble. So for at least, I'll, I'll give them credit, I'll say at least 60, 70 years we've been saying that, that, um, that humanity originated in sub-Saharan Africa. But just a, a few weeks ago, back in August, um, a report was released that the Human Genome Project, which is a weird thing in and of itself, but the Human Genome Project has definitively determined that humanity did not originate in sub-Saharan Africa. It originated somewhere in the Fertile Crescent. Guess what else is in the Fertile Crescent? The Tigris and the Euphrates River. So, once again, it proves that. Uh, back, to, back to this area, the creation stories. Uh, and, and I think this is important uh, for a couple of reasons. In the Babylonian story, it's called the Enuma Elish. Uh, you don't need to remember that. But there's a creation account there, and it's one of the fascinating ones. They're all kind of strange uh, stories there. But... Um, it's, you know, they, they made up these great stories because they couldn't figure out how in the world uh, the world was created. So they made up these stories about monsters and dragons and lizards and snakes and all these other kind of things and gods and goddesses. And so there was, the, there was this goddess named Tiamat. And Tiamat was uh, the, the goddess of chaos and the goddess of the ocean. Um, the Phoenicians called her Yam, Y-A-M-M. -M. You don't need to know that, but it's, uh, you don't need to remember that, but I, I will put it in there in a minute. Um, so um, she had, there was a bunch of younger gods. Now here you go, this is kind of crazy. But, but they wanted to kill her. So she was going to kill them before they killed her. But one of those younger gods' name was Marduk. And Marduk said, I'm not going to wait on her to kill me. So he takes a bow and arrow, which is interesting if, that you can, you know, take a bow and arrow and shoot a god. So that just proves that it's not real. But anyway, uh, Marduk takes a bow and arrow and shoots Tiamat right between the eyes and um, splits her head wide open. And out of her bleeding head, I guess, uh, one eye comes the Tigris River and the other eye comes the Euphrates River. <laughs> Uh, yeah, that's some strange stuff, ain't it? Um, uh, I'll get back to Tiamat in a minute. That's the world uh, that that was there when when uh, Genesis one was was written. Uh, it was a world that. There were these strange gods and goddesses, and the stars had power, and the sun had power, and it controlled human lives and human destinies, and you had to feed your babies to uh, uh, Molech, or uh, you had to have uh, Asherah poles or, or Baal, you had to make sacrifices, um, and all of this, Moses writes... Uh, that God said, let there be light, and I don't need those stars. I don't need the sun to create my light. I'll do it because I'm the only one in control, and I can and do control everything. That's day one. Um, <coughs> back to the bit about chaos. And I'll tie this in right quick. God, Moses. Um, <laughs> speaking of Moses. Uh, the, the story of Jesus walking on the water is not a parlor trick. Uh, first of all, Jesus, do I believe Jesus walked on water? Absolutely. <coughs> Jesus literally, uh, physically walked on the water. Uh, it, was a, it was an instance, an indication of his divinity, that he was God, and that he again was stronger and controlled the powers and the forces of nature. Likewise, when he calmed the storm, the whole thing. Uh, he pulled Peter out into the water and said, walk. And Peter, you know, same, same business. It was Jesus was controlling. But there is uh, also an underlying theological message 
in what Jesus was doing. He was proving to these people um, something else. Tiamat was the god of the ocean, the god of the sea, the god of chaos. The cognate of Tiamat <coughs> was, was a Middle Eastern god named Yom, Y-A-M-M. So for Jesus to walk on the water, think about, um, think about the passages of Scripture in the Psalms where it says, I will make his enemies his footstool, or that he will crush the head of Satan. So to put your foot on something is to have power and control and authority over it. So when Jesus walks on water, it's just a very similar indication uh, to go back to Genesis chapter 1 that God controls chaos and he has all authority. Jesus walking on water is the same thing that it said, it is being said in Genesis no, uh, chapter 1 that he has total authority over chaos. So again, even though we all get beside ourselves and I'm guilty as, as sin too, when things tend to go wrong, because it doesn't seem like things all things don't go wrong nicely in our lives and on anybody's schedule, do they? They go wrong when they when you least expect it, and a lot of times they all seem to come down. At, you know the Morton Salt thing: when it rains, it pours. But the thing is, it doesn't matter how much it's pouring. Jesus, God, is still in control, and He is more powerful than the chaos in our lives. Um, second day of creation, God creates the sky to separate the waters above, the clouds, and all that stuff from the waters below. He's bringing in structure to the chaos. Now, I will throw this in. I wanted to put a diagram in there, but I didn't. Um, so he separates the waters from above and the waters from below. Now, one way to look at that is that we can look at it in modern terms that the waters above or, uh, are the rain. It, you know, the rain and the clouds are all vapor and mist and all this stuff. And the waters below, the water, blah, blah, blah. But there is something else that we also need to remember that the book of Genesis tell, that teaches us is that prior to the flood, it did not rain on the earth. So there was a there was a there was a mist that watered the earth. That, that water probably watered the earth from below, maybe. But um, so I don't want us to get too caught up in saying, "Well, the well, water's above where the rain had fell," because the rain didn't fall on Adam or Eve or Cain or Abel or any of those other people leading up to. You know, it was a totally new phenomenon when it started to rain on. The, um, you know, the people when Noah was sh shutting up the ark. Boy, if, if I had been there, I'd probably been one of them that got left off the ark. But I would have been beating at that door if it was raining. But you think, except they didn't know what rain was. That's why there wasn't chaos trying to get on the boat. You ever thought about that? Yeah, but they didn't know what rain was. Anyway, so let's, do, let's go on to... Um, God saw that it was good. There you go. Uh, uh, third day, God says, let the earth spout, uh, sprout vegetation, plants yielding seed and fruit bearing trees um, in which their seed uh, bear trees, uh, <coughs> bear, I can't read. Fruit, fruit bearing, uh, trees bearing fruit in which their seed is their seed each according to its kind. The earth brought forth vegetation, plants yielding seed according to their own kinds, trees bearing fruit, etc., etc. God saw that it was good. There was evening and there was morning the third day. And on the third day, God separates the water so we have more water we have more land. Now listen. Again, this is order <coughs> that God has created. Things just don't happen. Take kudzu, for instance. <laughs> <Please>. <laughs> You know, now, a lot of people say if you stand still long enough, you know, the kudzu will grow on you. But in South Carolina, it's one of two things. If you stand still long enough, you'll either get grown over by kudzu or they'll name something after Strong Thurman. So <laughs> that's, that's what it is. 
Uh, but um, um, kudzu. Uh, thank FDR for kudzu. FDR is, a, is the rascal that brought kudzu to the south with the Civilian Conservation Corps in order to keep erosion down. They thought it'd be a great thing. And then it took over and again, if you stand still long enough, it'll choke you to death and you'll never, they'll never find you again. But the thing about kudzu is, when you plant, if you ever don't plant kudzu, <laughs> goodness sake. <laughs> but and here's the thing, if you do dig it up and you throw it somewhere, it's gonna grow there. You have to burn kudzu. You literally have to burn it to a crisp. But, but the thing about kudzu is if, if kudzu's growing, uh, it does have really nice smelling flowers on it, but kudzu ain't gonna produce corn. <laughs> kudzu, you won't find strawberries on the end of the kudzu vine. Um, there won't be, a, uh, even though they're vines, you won't have a pumpkin or a watermelon. Why? Because that's what God made. Watermelons create watermelons. Pumpkins create pumpkins. Cows create cows. They don't create chickens. Um, everything again. Notice that God <coughs> said everything is going to is going to create uh, after its own kind. This is also getting into modern stuff and science and maybe a little politics. This is why it bothers me so much that there's so much scientific experiment experimentation in the realm of of, of biology and agriculture and. Other things, trying to make this thing produce that thing, or trying to do this on that, or with that, or through that, and that is outside of the natural order of, of things, if you, if you believe the Bible. Um, there may be some benefits scientifically for, you know, messing around here and messing around there, but there's always a problem. Uh, for instance, corn, for instance, go back to corn. Um, so they thought, you know, 50 years ago it was a great idea to genetically modify corn because you could make corn sweeter and you could also make corn um, produce more and not have the disease problems because the world population was growing you know, and all this other kind of stuff. Well, with that ultra sweet corn, now you have, they even have some names to it. That's super ultra sweet corn and all this times 10 and all this Craig knows about it. Corn and Bernard knows about corn stuff. But now guess what? Uh, a, a regular um, uh, heirloom corn, if it, it won't last. Uh, there, there's going to be problems in the future. There, it might even disappear because genetically modified corn will cross-pollinate and out-pollinate heirloom corn. And so old-fashioned corn may disappear in 100 years because of that. Um, the other thing is, it's interesting as a side effect, is that genetically modified corn, um, with all that sugar enhancement, um, we see a spike in diabetes uh, over the last 50 years as well. And no decline on eating corn. It is, I mean, I love corn, but you know, there's always this thing, if you want your pigs to get fat, feed them corn. And now we're eating corn with everything, corn syrup and everything else. But see, this is not how God created. He didn't create to, uh, for us to genetically mess with, the, with everything. Even if we had good intentions necessarily, God said, this will produce this. This will produce this. This is the way I made it. Leave it alone and it will work. God is a God of order and a God of process. Then God said... Um, this. Um, produce vegetation, produce fruit. Um, the land does not have the ability to produce life. The earth itself doesn't have the power to produce life. The power to produce life is only there because God said do it. Does that make sense? I, I'm just trying to get you to have the idea and the understanding that nothing happens apart from the powerful Word of God. There is no Mother Earth that, 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 that makes it uh, happen. 
um, that um, that somehow you have to appease or pacify or, or sacrifice to in order to make your crops grow. Uh, fertility goddesses um, and gods. Baal was a fertility god. Um, in Germany, the, the god Easter was a fertility god. Where do we get the word for Easter? It was a spring uh, thing. Um, but that, that could be fur further from the truth. There's no fertility gods or goddesses. There's no power in the earth in and of itself. Life comes because God said, let it be. Go back to corn. Corn grows because God said grow corn. That's the, the bottom line. Um, there is only one God. Nobody is helping him. He is supreme. He is sovereign. And he is alone. He is powerful. And he is speaking. So we have the world now inhabitable. So we got days four, five, and six. Um, I'm going to get there. I'm almost finished. Um, day four, he says, let there be lights in the expanse of the heavens to separate the, the day from the night. And let them be for signs of the seasons and days and years. And um, let it give life, light on the earth. And it was so. And God made two great lights. The greater light to rule the day, and, which is the sun. The lesser light to rule the night, which is the moon and stars. This is also revolutionary because in ancient times the sun was worshipped. Um, thought to be the supreme God. Amun Ra of the... Uh, of the Egyptians, the supreme god, uh, uh, Jehoane, uh, the supreme god of the Navajo Indians, uh, the Hopi Indians have Tawa, the um, Napioha uh, is the sun god of the Blackfoot, Quetzalcoatl is the sun god in Aztec culture, uh, in Maine and Nova Scotia, the Indians up there, the uh, Abenaki Indians have a have one called Kisosan. Uh, you might know it by the Roman name Saul, uh, the Roman god Helios in Greek. Mithra in Persia. Baal was a sun god in Canaanite culture. Surya, a Hindu. Um, and people worshipped these. Uh, False gods, the sun. One of the um, one of the Indian uh, ones, and I don't remember which one it was, um, but uh, one of the American Indian uh, legends was that the god carried the sun. You couldn't see the god, but you could see the sun. That the god carried the sun from the east to the west across the sky during the day. Um, and another of the Indian legends was that God actually was an eagle and his heart was the sun. And in the daytime, he would open his wings and you could see his uh, heart, which was the sun. And at night, he would close his wings and go to sleep. Um, and this was how primitive people without God uh, worshipped and what they thought. Um, and then, of course... You know, people read uh, horoscopes, and all from the from the be, you know beginning of time, they've worshipped stars. The Magi in the in the Christmas story were somewhere between astronomers, legitimate people who looked at the stars, and astrologers, um, people who told fortunes in the future by the stars. Um, but God just sort of casually says. Let there be stars. Let there be a sun. Let there be a moon. Um, he places things where they should go. He determines their functions. The stars are not gods. They don't have any power. They're not authorities of anything. Um, but still, all you got to do is ride up and down the road between, you know, just get on Main Street and drive down Lawrence Road and go all the way to Greenville. You'll, find, you'll pass four or five people that have horoscopes read. 
out there in their yards or psychic sister or some kind of craziness out there. <laughs> um, and people will pay for it. I'm like, we need new um, air conditioning. <laughs> don't throw your money away. I mean, if you're going to throw your money away, just throw it out the window. I'll come by and pick it up. But don't go to this lady that's going to tell you something that's not true. Oh, um, so, um, and then, uh, let's see, day five, God says, let the water swarm and, and living creatures and birds and, and all this, and God saw that it was good. Then he says something that he, that he hasn't said before, be fruitful and multiply, fill the waters and the sea, let the birds multiply on the earth, there was evening, there was morning, the fifth day. God does something um, amazing here uh, that is a little bit different um, from the way he talked about trees and plants and let them produce after their own kind. He gets, he gets, he moves away from horticulture um, and into biology now. And and this is this is fascinating because people say it's not. Uh, no science, but but there is science because it's, it's very scientific. Um, trees and plants produce after their own kind, and that's how it works. This seed grows that plant, grow that plant. At the end of the season, you get the same seed and you plant it over again. Birds and fish and animals and people multiply. One seed will make one plant, but birds and animal and, and fish and people multiply. We're not we're not we're not restricted or restricted to just one one thing. Um, there is no. says he is, then you have to deal with that. And you either deal it by rejection or you deal with it by obedience. But the world doesn't want to obey because the world doesn't want to be answerable and it thinks that by disobediently rejecting God it does not have to be answerable, but that's just lunacy. By the way, there are no such things as natural atheists. There's no such thing as an atheist. The, the, the knowledge of God or the, 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 the knowledge that God exists is written in every human being. It is a, there, a person who is an atheist will say is there's someone who doesn't believe in God. That's not true. 
they are a person who has rejected the belief in God. There's a fundamental difference. They believe, they just don't want to believe. That's the bottom line. Um, Romans 1 says that we are sinful because we worship creation rather than God. But that's such a silly and foolish and futile thing because Genesis 1 simply tells us that creation is nothing but that God put it here. It has no power in and of itself. God is the one who made it. Genesis 1, then, the, the whole point is to enlarge our vision of God, our understanding of God. How big is your God? That's the question that should be answered in Genesis chapter 1. How big is your God? My God is big enough that he can do all of these things. Not only is he big enough that he can do, he is because he did do. So that, I guess I got to go. Um, <laughs> next week, um, we'll, we will get, our story will be Adam and Eve and all that. But listen, don't forget, let me just put something down up here. Um, please take a moment.